This show is presented by the 323 Network. You can watch all your favorite 323 friends and shows on the 323 Network YouTube channel. Follow us on all social media platforms at 323read. And support us as we continue to grow at patreon.com slash 323read. That's 323-R-E-I-D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 323. I am your host, Reed Murphy. I'm really happy for you. I'm going to let you finish. Who the fuck is that guy? Look at the show. I'm the company. Welcome to the fucking show. Fuck Scott. Welcome back, college football fans. This is your host, Scott Elia, with College Shame Day, presented by the 323 Network. We are back, and we are in full force this year for Season 2. I've been renewed. This is amazing. I didn't think it, I didn't think it was possible. That's right. Who do you think you are? I am. I am Scott Elliott, and I am joined the Desmond Howard to my Lee Corso today with the big daddy himself, Reed Murphy. How you doing, Reed? I am doing great. I'm doing especially great after that sound. I completely forgot about our uh, our bowling buddy. Who do you think you are? You are Ooh. him. You know what? I am him, and it, what, what, who is that's uh peter uh peter uh what's his last name i don't know either way he's him i'm on it i'm the producer oh thank you sir i appreciate it but yeah folks it's gonna be a, a nice little tasty morsel a little bit of an appetizer rolling into this 2024 2025 college football season coming up on week zero um a little peek behind the curtain we are recording this on a friday august 23rd tomorrow is the beginning of the college football season with the week zero games um but there are some major updates going into the season you know conference changes huge transfer portal acquisitions um the expanded 12 team college football playoff is this is gonna be the first season with that so we'll get into that here in a little bit um but for folks who are kind of not so much in the know with these conference changes uh the pac-12 is dead officially i guess but not really reed it's still a thing because washington state and oregon state are still in there um they do have an agreement with the mountain west through the season to have some kind of scheduling um assistance it might extend the next year there's been reports that they might join the big 12 who knows um but i it, it, all signs point though it's dead because it's no longer a power five con it's power four now it's, it's power four and of the pack two like i don't I, they're hanging on they're hanging on like you know some people's hairlines like mine but it's it's only a matter of time i guess that they're going well, to have to get well now you know somebody. why i wear a hat all the time because well, yeah, i I'm going to go for the hat look. I might get an FSU hat just to rock on shame days, just for uniform. Well, you know what? You know, you don't have to just align yourself with me because I refuse to align myself with the commanders. Uh, how about one of these new teams that align themselves with new conferences? You know, you got SMU, who's leaving the AAC to the ACC. Speaking about the ACC and the Pac-12, you have Stanford and Cal jumping ship to the ACC this year. Um, the other Pac-12 teams, Utah, Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado are in the Big 12. Oregon, Washington, UC, USC, and UCLA are now in the Big Ten. And Texas and Oklahoma are now going from the Big 12 to SEC. So huge, huge shakeups uh, from there. Oh, and by the way, we're now one less independent team in college football because Army is now in the AAC, pretty much replacing SMU. So congrats to them. Very interesting to see Army join a conference. Right? Well, especially because the last ones that we have left over would be would be UMass, which strangely enough, I guess they're just so bad. Nobody wants them to be a part of their conference. Notre Dame, who feels like their shit don't stink and they don't need to be a tie to anybody officially. And then I believe the last one would be Navy. 
it, maybe I can get a fact at the end of the show. It has to be. I'm yeah, I'm on that, looking into that right now. I have yeah, Notre Dame. Yeah, Notre Dame. Con- yeah, Connecticut. Oh, UConn. Yeah, UConn. UC- yeah, UConn, Notre Dame, and UMass. And UMass, but it has UMass highlighted in rose because they will be departing apparently. Oh, good for them. Yes. Good for them. But no, not just are there major shakeups from teams jump transferring from one conference to another. We also have some major transfers as far as the players go. Um, for instance, Caleb Downs, defensive back from Alabama, who's now going to Ohio State. Walter Nolan, D. Lyman from Texas A&M going to Ole Miss. Julian Sand, freshman quarterback going from Alabama to Ohio State. Ohio State is on this list multiple times. I mean, they also got Quinshawn Judkins running back from Ole Miss, who I think is going to be lighting it up. Oh, and not to mention Isaiah Bond. Part of that mass exodus from Alabama now that Nick Saban is retired. He's leaving, going to Texas. And also Cam Ward kind of leaving Washington State for Miami. I think that is a very great acquisition on Miami's part. Um, hopefully he's able to translate his you know Heisman hopeful season he had last year down there in South Beach. And also Riley Leonard, Notre Dame just poaching another ACC quarterback. <laughs> Getting Riley and Leonard to leave from going to Duke to Notre Dame. So... Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a very interesting season. It's gonna be a very exciting season. Um, the one thing that kind of tempers my expectations a little bit is with the AP poll and them releasing rankings so early into the season. I don't feel that it's necessary. Um, not only do we have major things we just talked about between teams and players, but you know we have very limited sample sizes. You know, early games are often involve weaker opponents, um, making it hard to really accurately assess the teams that are playing. Um, Reed, do you feel that the AP poll is, is too early or do you think they have it? It's okay with it being preseason. Would you like to see it later on down the line? I, I think I would like some type of unoffic, like something that's not official. I don't think that you can properly rank teams this early, you know, going into a season, something you can after week one, sure. Do whatever you want. But this early when you have, where was Miami ranked 19th? Yes. Yeah, that was like one of the more egregious ones that I saw. Um, yeah, it it should have a little bit more of a delay, but whatever gets people excited, whatever generates some type of hype and hope for people. But you can also put some schools into a bad position that have to try and overcome not being ranked early or you know just are stuck there in the late 20s and find it impossible to move up you could make an argument for anybody to be you know placed into a spot exactly you know i think it just further just kind of reinforces some sort of bias you know high preseason rankings you know it really just unfairly influence perceptions and making it difficult for those unranked teams to actually move up i mean some of these olis you know louisville had 111 votes virginia tech had 77 boise state had 47 um Colorado had one. How they even got one is beyond me after only mustering up four wins this past season. Uh, <laughs> hopefully this is the only Colorado kind of talk we have on this show, but knowing how Dion is, I'm, I'm sure his name will come up at some point down the line. Yeah. Has to. Well, and, and not only does it kind of reinforce that biases but you know especially with media narratives you know early rankings drive the media coverage and the tension you know college shame day college shame day i wish we were going to ireland but college game day <laughs> they're going across the pond going to ireland for um what may or may not be the game of the week here at college shame day with number 10 florida state facing off against georgia tech um but you know when you have a team let's say for instance Ole miss Ole miss is up here at number six right now that's that's a team you could see slowly fall down the rankings, especially being in a highly competitive SEC environment. Um, are there any teams that you might think could face similar kind of ramifications from being ranked so high so early on? I I think the... Or even being ranked in general. N- not yet so far on just... Um, on just in general but and i don't want to put them in this i don't want to doubt them this early because i know how this usually goes but alabama is one losing saban i think is going to be a huge impact on that team you see mostly with any especially these dynasty teams in college 
and you see it with Ohio State, which is one to watch this year, I would think, where their legendary coach will retire. The person who's established all of this, who's built all of this up, is gone, and the next person to come in can keep it going for a little bit. The parts are there. You'll get like three years of looking the same as that dynasty, and then it starts to fall apart. We've been seeing that with Ohio State. I think that this is going to be the big year that they do drop. I think Ohio Ooh. State has some issues. Right now, they are ranked uh, second. I don't think they make the playoff this year. Even wow. in expansion, I, I have a hot take on that. I don't think they make the playoff. I think Ryan Day completely falls apart on that. So if there's a team that I could see uh, having that issue, it's going to be Ohio State on the bold prediction. Otherwise, um, just looking at it... I don't hate it too much. Miami being at 19 has a huge start taking on Florida in game one that I think will make or break that ranking. Um, otherwise, you know, Southern California, we got, uh, you know, USC there at 23. Going to be interesting to see if Lincoln Riley can get that any type of boost there. Iowa at 25. We just have Ferentz suspension. You just talk about consistency. And apparently that was linked to the whole Cade McNamara <laughs> acquisition, him transferring over there. I guess it's tied to him. But I mean, talk about a team who literally is probably, it's probably the most boring team to watch in college football. And here they are year in and year out. They're constant, they're consistently in the top 25 and they're going to stay there. They're going to stay there. But I, I, I don't think your Ohio state call out is, totally off base i mean like i said you have teams like oregon and washington and usc and ucla leaving and going into the big 10 that's just going to make the big 10 even that much more difficult you know sec north at this point um you really feel for james franklin and penn state because yes. every year they seem to take a step forward they had a are forced to take two or three steps back so i think that's another team to kind of watch out for slowly drop down out of the top 25 at this point yeah yeah i on- Poor Penn State. Nothing. And well, see, I say poor Penn State, knowing the history and knowing nah. everything that's happened. Eh. But yeah, you do have to feel what feel for them every time they do take that step. That's perfectly stated. They will always take two steps back. Right. Well, and this just further reaffirms my belief that there really shouldn't be any official official rankings until at least past week four. You know, at least this would give you know underdog teams the best possible shot to earn their spot based off their performance versus based off of what they like what have you been doing for me recently rather than what have you done for me in the past because like we talked about with these conference changes and players you know hitting the transfer portal seemingly every single day and moving teams you know it's hard enough for us on the nfl side to really point the finger at okay who's the top team and there's not as much turnover in the nfl unless the team's in complete rebuild mode who if they're in that circumstance you're just kicking them to the end of the line anyways i mean taking a thousand foot view right now i mean if you had a pick between the niners and the chiefs to be number one overall in the nfl could you confidently tell me who it is no, I mean, you can, you, the, the confident way that you go into it is the one that just re- won most recently. You're going to say Kansas City at that. And I mean, that's basically the same, I guess, that's happening here. George is an easy number one when you're doing these rankings. If you're going to do, if you they say you do a top 10 to start the season, that's, you know, you're giving people something, but it's also not too much of a guess because most of these teams, you're going to have Georgia number one. You'll have, you know, your arguments with Ohio State at two, Oregon at three, Texas at four. Bama's always safe to throw in there. It's it's not hard. And, of course, Michigan. Michigan being at nine mm-hmm. is the wild step for me. Like, they, well, is it really Jim Harbaugh being gone that is that much of a detractor? It right. makes them that uh, unattractive. Right. I mean, you even think about who they faced off against in that national championship game last year with Washington, with the Huskies. Right. Where are they at right now? They only got 23 votes to be in the top 25. You don't think them even being the runner up last year was enough to justify them being in the top 25? That's you know, it's just yeah. the, the, the whole basis of this is just completely 
completely out of left field. It's all about who you know and you know who they want to try to prop up the best give the, give the best possible chance to get into um, the college football playoff. And speaking about the college football playoff, Reed, this is going to be the first year with the expanded 12 team college football playoff. This is going to be wild. Um, for those who don't know, this opening it up from what we've been kind of used to in the past, you know, when BCS era was number one, number two, it was kind of hard to figure out who those two most deserving teams would be. So I expanded it to the playoffs. And then now we see the situation we had last year, you know, Florida state being snubbed and not going into that top four, being able to contend for the national football uh, national championship. Um, there are some nuanced items that I'd like to go over with you, Reed, because I don't know how well versed you are with a lot of these specifics on how it kind of works. I'm not, so please educate. All right, so the college football playoff selection committee will still rank the top 25 teams. Uh, the 12 teams will consist of the five highest ranked conference championships or conference champions, and then also the next seven highest ranked teams. Um, so yeah, the SEC champion, ACC, Big Ten, Big 12, and I guess they're going to go Conference USA. I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's probably where they're going to go. Um, and then the four highest ranked conference champs will be one through four with that first round by that fifth outside the OLI conference champ will join the seven at large bids to make up seeds five through 12. But then we kind of touched up on it about the independent teams, especially Notre Dame. Notre Dame right now is sitting at number seven um, with their schedule and how well that team has been performing the last couple seasons. It's not completely out of the realm of possibility for them to be able to get into the college football playoff. But for non-conference champs and independents like Notre Dame that are ranked in the top four, they will be seated no higher than five. So even if they are in that, even if Notre Dame is in that top four, they still can only go as high as five, which could shake up seating at the end of the day. That's going to be, how's that? That's going to be very interesting going into this and very, I, I mean, we're no matter what, right? No matter what they change, you're always going to have a controversy. You're always going to have people who are going to have an issue with it. So yeah, I'm curious. So like looking at it from last year, right? And maybe this wouldn't, maybe there's a different way like right last year we had one two three four michigan washington texas bama um obviously fsu would have made it in georgia ohio state oregon missouri penn state ole miss and oklahoma would have been those 12 if you're just going off of that base ranking but right with that with those new rules does that shift what that would have looked like last year uh, yes, because if you look at the champions, it was Michigan, Washington, Florida State, and then Georgia. So Georgia, Georgia won out. No, wait. It was SEC champions Bama over Georgia. Right. So Bama, yeah. So Bama would have been in there automatically into a top four seating without simply because of that. Yeah. Right. But then you would still would have had like Texas and Georgia and Missouri and Ole Miss, like all these SEC. Needless to say, this, this the college football playoffs is going to be brutal with SEC teams. Yes. That's just going to be a given. It's going to be SEC, Big Ten, and then like your Big 12 and ACC champion. And that's pretty much what it's going to boil down to. And they'll it's, be happy it, to have that. Right. But it, it, just think about the, the amount of controversy that would happen. Like, say, if a Georgia and Alabama faced off in the SEC championship game, one wins the SEC, and then they face off again later down the road yep. <laughs> in the championship game. for the Like, what would you rather have? Would you rather have the higher seed and get the conference championship for a better chance at it? Or would you – Would obviously, the national championship probably – it, it means more. Yeah. But are you totally that upset if you don't get it? I, I mean, no matter what, you're coming out with something. It's just like, it's like a, it, you, it becomes a happy to be here situation for a few teams. Well, I will say, thankfully, that there won't be any reseeding once the bracket is set on selection day on December 8th, I believe, is selection day. Um, so that'll be really cool. Um, going into the first round, that'll take place. And this is just going to be a whirlwind. Reed, we're going to be nonstop for about a month yeah. <laughs> of, between college and college the end of the college football season the conference championships the college football playoff national title and then you roll into all the nfl stuff it's gonna be 
nonstop starting in December. Um, first round starts February, uh, starts Friday, December 20th and Saturday, December 21st. Higher seeds are hosting at their campus, so it won't be a neutral playing field situation. Whoever has a higher seed gets the home game. Rolling into the next round, the quarterfinal, and that will be December 31st and February and January 1st. So the four highest ranked conference championships will be assigned bowls based on their historical relationships, what I thought was a really, really cool thing. Um, so Fiesta Bowl, which historically has, you know, Big 12, Pac-12, which Pac-2 now, Big 10 kind of implications. The Rose Bowls traditionally always play between the Big 10 and the Pac-12. Peach Bowl is usually the SEC and the ACC, and the Sugar Bowl is usually the SEC and the Big 12. So I think that's a really nice little spin to still keep some kind of, you know, relevance tied to these bowl games, but doing it in a fun way with the playoff. And you talk about things being a whirlwind, and it will be a true whirlwind for us, possibly maybe needing to, you know, handle it at a Gus's Bar and Grill where we'll be doing our season opener game for the NFL. But here on Saturday, December 21st, it's the second day of the first round of the new college football playoff. It includes a triple header of games played on campuses. But that same day, the NFL will be playing a double header with Houston at Kansas City at 1 p.m. and Pittsburgh at Baltimore at 4.30. Those games will run directly against the college football playoffs first two games set for 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. for college football's 8 p.m. prime playoff. Likely won't have any situation. College football got excited there. I was about to say, it got so excited that it didn't. <laughs> the, the program forgot how to work. But for folks who are listening who aren't privy to the information of Gus's Sports Bar and Grill, um, we want to, want to give them a little tidbit of information that they may have missed on the top five award show that we recently did yes because this will actually be heard first before that show so you get the preview right there on uh sunday september 8th the 323 network we will be at gus's bar and grill in richmond virginia we will be covering the nfl opening you know nfl opening sunday primarily washington commanders versus the tampa bay buccaneers scott's team versus me and zoo's team you will see me, Scott, Zoo, Angela Panegua, plenty more uh, friends of the show. A lot of Cleveland Browns fans, apparently. Come check us out. We will be there. We will be hanging out all day. You'll be able to catch us live on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, wherever. We will have all the links. Just follow at 323REID uh, on all the social medias, and you will, you will see us. 323 Network on YouTube, where you're watching us now. Uh, you know what, Reed? You bring up a good point because I completely forgot about that bar being a hub for Cleveland Browns fans. So I would, it's, I think it's safe to assume that a lot of those Browns fans are probably Buckeye fans. Are you going to share them your hot take when Ooh, we're there? I just <laughs> might not. We'll, we'll we'll feel them out. We'll feel them out. Oh man! But rolling after the quarterfinals gets you to semifinals Thursday, January 9th, and the January 10th. The top seed receives preferential bowl placement between the Orange Bowl and the Cotton Bowl. So that could be interesting to see what the, what the committee decides to change there. And then rolling in into championship Monday, January 20th in Atlanta. Man, could you imagine? Could Georgia ask for anything more just given to them on a silver platter at this point? A silver Waffle House platter at this point. Being able to have a championship game in Atlanta. Haven't they haven't didn't we have that recently too? Their most yeah, their like, more recent championship was in Atlanta. It's just like I guess they it's a good way to guarantee selling tickets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. You will have it filled out. <laughs> oh boy. But like I said, if anything, it, it's gonna provide so much excitement. Just twists and turns and that two month span read, I'm gonna be burnt out by the time Valentine's <laughs> Day rolls around. <laughs> We'll keep you going, though. Oh, but this, but like I said, with me not believing that there should be an AP poll anytime bet before week four, I'm not giving my shameful eight read. I'm not giving the folks it. I'm not giving the folks what they want don't because do. I'm not, I'm not perpetuating what I don't agree in. I'm not doing this. This is my soapbox. You're not getting the shameful eight until week five. So deal with it. 
but you know something that you are going to get right now heisman watch hey Scott's, scott's top five players that he will be watching rolling into the season because that's something that doesn't matter it's going to be exciting and reed i think i think this could be the year i think this could be the year that someone on defense finally wins wow i think i know who you might be going for Ooh, well we're gonna start out with number five this the the first two are gonna be names that are fairly familiar to everybody in the college football world dylan gabriel quarterback at oregon uh, he is the uh, old man of, of this list he's been playing i think this is his sixth collegiate season so maybe seven but i mean if you go back and look at his stats for his career i mean he's been consistent you know and especially last year you know posting 69.3 percent completion rating for 3600 yards 30 touchdowns and six picks um especially in a dan landing offense going from the pac-12 to the big 10 i think that's still going to translate fairly well um i think he is going to be towards the top of that list by the end of the season as well as quarterback for georgia carson beck who last year was it was kind of was kind of quiet um he he did have you know 72 percent completion rating 3700 yards 22 touchdowns and six picks as well um but i think being on the the, the reigning champ going into the season as the favorite the most likely national champ for this year as well i think that kind of bolsters his stock just a little bit um going into number three we're going to go with Ollie Gordon, the second running back, Oklahoma State. And I'm excited about, That's you know, especially name. with, I mean, we've talked about for years now how the running back market is just all over the place, especially in the NFL. You know, a lot of teams don't like giving those players that second, third contract. They like getting these rookie deals. So whoever ends up landing Ollie Gordon on their rookie contract is going to be getting a stud, not only on the ground. You know, last year posted 258 carries for 1,600 yards, averaging about six six yards a six yard a touch read. How would you like that in Washington? I would love that in Washington. How, how would you like 20 touchdowns and zero, zero fumbles? That's a remarkable stat. Right. Zero Talk fumbles. about ball protection yeah all right on the ground but also receiving as well 37 receptions for 320 yards averaging eight yards a pop for one touchdown i mean eight yards on a reception is wild yeah. i mean if you can pretty much guarantee me a first down every time you touch the ball i'm taking it yep. i'm taking it all day but like i said i think we could see some kind of defender getting it this year um two players that i'm really going to be watching closely is going to be mason graham defensive tackle from michigan last year posted 28 tackles three sacks forced fumble and a fumble recovery but the one that i'm most excited for and these sec homers are going to hate it because every sec fan that i know hates this team and that is the edge rusher out of tennessee james pierce jr oh. yep Last year, 24 total tackles, eight and a half sacks, one forced fumble. I think he is going to be playing like a man on fire, and he will more than likely be in that top five, top three uh, pick kind of realm for next year's NFL draft. He is he is a very impressive edge rusher. The person that I actually thought that you were going to say, and I'm curious your thoughts on him and how he might do this season, is the safety out of my uh, my fall off the ranks team in Ohio State, uh, Caleb Downs, that transfer oh. from Bama, who I have heard nothing but impressive stuff about him. I he's a hell of a player, a vicious safety, and somebody who I mean, coaches have been saying they have never seen somebody that young take command of a defense and know exactly where everything is know exactly where everything's going uh do you think there's any possible shot for him oh absolutely i mean he's going into sophomore season last year's freshman season's total 
almost got to 100. He got 99 total tackles. You know, he got a force fumble. He got a fumble recovery. He got two picks. But he plays lights out, sideline to sideline. He's going to be a talent that's going to be wrecking the Big Ten and the college football world for years to come. But I think the where the bias kind of comes from this with Reed is I don't like giving Ohio State and the state of Ohio anything. So that's why I'm specifically keeping him off my list officially. Now... It, you go on bias. Let me really get you like sparked up here a little bit on two other options that I'm no, sure some people will don't even say it. They're staying off the list. They will never be mentioned on this show. Shador <laughs> Sanders and Travis Hunter. Oh my God. They need to worry about wins. Like I said, <laughs> they got four wins last season and like you can't, you can't expect to be in the talk of Heisman. Yes. you Heisman is the, 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 MVP of the league, you know, best player on the league, blah, 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 blah. But part of that, part of being the best player, especially at quarterback, is being able to translate your stats and your talent into wins for the team. And if all you're be able to do is muster up four wins, that you, you, no, you can't get it. And then Travis Hunter, I think there's been reports coming out of Colorado that they're really trying to force his hand into picking between wide receiver and D back. They really don't want him to do Ironman football because we saw how just riddled his body got with injuries last year, trying to play that many snaps. And I think a lot of NFL teams are worried about that and they would like to see him just solely focus on one side, but um, not out of the realm possibility because of the name they're attached to in slime time with Deion Sanders. Like it, it, they could get it. They could squeak in there to get a couple votes, but as far as it being reality, no, I don't see it. I don't see it. Hopefully that answers your question. It did. <laughs> it got the, I'm sure it'll 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 generate the haters that we need. Yeah, well, they it's, they have bigger fish to fry, you know. Especially they're opening up their first game uh, this year at home against North Dakota State, which I'm calling upset. So fuck them. Uh, but <laughs> talking about talking about games that I'm excited to see. Uh, let's get into this week's game of the week. Read. Hey. Oh boy, folks. Yes, that is right. Game of the week week zero there is only just to preface this read there's only four games you got montana state going to new mexico you got smu traveling to nevada delaware state going to hawaii and read i don't know if you've seen this the debacle that's going on with that right now um but i need to see if there's an update because delaware state should have been there by now oh no. <laughs> last i reported <laughs> <laughs> Due to a, a bus snafu, specifically, and I'm quoting that the Delaware State spokesperson that the they missed their flight <laughs> from New York to get to Hawaii. So I hope they're there. I haven't seen any reports that they're there yet. So fingers crossed. I shall look into it. I mean, and mind you, you got to remember that's a midnight East Coast tip off. <laughs> For this game, those Delaware State kids are going to be dragging ass if they aren't able to acclimate themselves as best they can bet, to that time. Bet the hell out of Hawaii. But I'll tell you one team who didn't have a snafu with their flight. That's number 10 Florida State traveling to Dublin, Ireland this week to face off against Georgia Tech in an international matchup. Um, they'll be playing at Aviva Stadium, marking the first international broadcast for ESPN's college game day. Is, can you believe this is the first time that J- game day has ever gone across international waters? I'm shocked that they haven't. I'm shocked that they've, yeah, because they've done this Ireland game, what, a few years now? A few years in I, a row. I remember Dan Patrick being there last year. Right, because wasn't Notre Dame out there? Yeah. Wasn't that the big draw? Yeah, like, you Dame thought that they would have gone out there. Yeah. Um, but first and foremost, before we get into any of the specifics about the game, I do want to say a quick congratulations to Georgia Tech's punter. David Shanahan, who is the first Irishman on a full American football scholarship. He'll be having a homecoming game today, this weekend in Dublin. Um, and he was actually able to get 40 tickets for his family, which anybody who is of Irish descent or knows anyone who's Irish knows that 40 tickets for his family is nowhere near enough. No, no it's not. But, congrat- but congratulations to you, David Shanahan. Um, but yes, I believe this marks the revenge tour for Florida State after being snubbed from the college football playoff. Uh, Cuck Herbstreet will be in attendance, Reed. So, and he is expecting to hear a lot of chirping from the SF, uh, FSU faithful. Um, did you see him on the most recent episode of the McAfee 
awesome show. I did not. And them just digging into him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. AJ Hawk just completely playing dumb, trying to figure out what's going on. I guess it's reported that Florida State traveled really, really well, um, looking at upwards of 30,000 Seminole fans oh, out there in Dublin. Oh, my God. All of those Floridians. Oh, uh, I can only. Dublin. They, oh, those poor Irish. That, oh, those poor Irish people are just completely thrown off. I mean, if you think about how, you know, the how Great Britain and the United Kingdom feel about Ireland, I feel like Ireland is probably the Florida comparison for, for the United Kingdom, where Florida is the comparison, is the land of debauchery for the United States. Well, it's the same level of shit that we send, like when uh, the Philadelphia 76ers played in London last year. So John McCann, the Philly <laughs> captain himself, was just roaming around London. Oh, could you imagine John McCann in Dublin right now? <laughs> <laughs> the Irish captain. Oh, but not only that, you know, both teams did did well, one more than the other last year. Florida State finished the regular season 13-1, and 8-0 and in the ACC. And Georgia Tech finished a very mediocre 7-6, and 5-3 in the ACC. I feel like they're going to be a lot more competitive this year. Um, there are some quarterbacks to spotlight, you know, both DJ Uyunglele, and I'm surprised I just got that on my first go read. Give me my fanfare. Then Give me my fanfare. That. Hold that. Right, I did it. I did it. And a more difficult name to say, Georgia Tech's quarterback, Haynes King. That's tough. That was a tough one. Uh, both dual threat quarterbacks are considered top players in the ACC. Uh, Uyunglele brings significant experience, while King, you know, he's really aiming to improve after a strong but turnover prone season last year. Um, I'm very happy to see DJU make his way back to the ACC. For those who don't know, he started off his collegiate career in Clemson. Um, that game is going to have all eyes on it, and I'm excited to see what that's going to do later on down the road. Um, but like I said, DJ Uingalele, former Clemson, Oregon State quarterback, deba debuting Florida State this week. Um, this will also be his first time playing abroad. So let's see how he does playing overseas. Hopefully um, but he treats her well. <laughs> More importantly, the FUS, FSU's offense, you know, uh, they have, they are really supporting him well with the experience that they have in the running back room and as well as their strong offensive line of returning so much just experience on that offensive front um, and also have talented receivers, including one from that Alabama exodus in Malik Benson, wide receiver transfer from there. But I'm very interested to see how that offense is going to be doing because Florida State's offensive coordinator, Alex Atkins, is suspended for recruiting violations. Um, their senior analyst, Gabe Fertitta, will assume his game day duties. Do you see, at, with Alex Atkins not at the helm for this weekend's game, do you see that causing a lot of issues? Um, or do you feel that they can kind of scrap something together and walk away with a win? I think with this being week zero that each team, every team is going to be a little rough for wear that some, you know, just sticking to a game plan, sticking to a script that, you know, the base, the base uh, pressure can be achieved and that they could scrap something together for an easy, for not an easy win, but you know, just, just get, get through the rough patches of both sides. Well, either way, I mean, Florida State thankfully has a little bit of a little bit of a soft schedule to open up. You know, after this, they have uh, Boston College, Memphis, and Cal all at home, so that'll be nice that'll be to be able nice. to travel back. And then on the flip side, Georgia Tech. After this, uh, they'll be at home against Georgia State, and then on the road against Syracuse, and then at home against uh, VMI, Virginia Military Academy uh, Institute. So, for those who don't know, but. Lame of the week, Reed. There's four games, but this is the happiest time of the year. Some may say their birthday is. Some may say, you know, this, the summertime is the greatest time of the year or the holiday season. But no, this right now, the, the week of last week of August going into September, you're transitioning into college football. You're transitioning in the NFL. You know, the hockey and the basketball season will be starting up again. So for sports lovers like me and you, this is the best time of year. And this is a time to celebrate. So there is no lame of the week. There Yay. is none. These are, they're all winners this week. And 
they will all also be included into this Wheel of Degenerate. And there's no point of spinning the wheel this week either, Reed, because there's only one ranked team playing, and that is number 10 Florida State, <laughs> Georgia Tech. So we're just going to run all four games into this we this week's Wheel of Degenerate betting slip um, to remind the folks number 10 FSU at Georgia Tech, Montana State at New Mexico, SMU at Nevada, and Delaware State at Hawaii. So look out for that at on the Instagram at 323 College Shame Day. If you want to bet with me, I will I will preface this by saying that my win-loss record last year, not only here on College Shame Day, but also um, over on the main channel 323. It, it wasn't the best last year. <laughs> so <laughs> so tem temper your expectations. But I feel of all weeks that I have the best possibility of winning <laughs> that parlay, it's going to be this week. Oh, folks, I'm so excited. You know, this is, like I said, the greatest time of year. We got a lot of fun things coming down the pipeline. I don't want to tip my hand too much, but there could be a couple college games where you could find these two darling faces at in the near future. Um, so look out for that announcement here in the next couple of weeks. Um, also, chances to be able to win, Reed. And that's right, win. Win some swag. Ooh. Win some swag. So keep an eye out for that. Everyone likes swag stuff we all get. But I want to leave you all with just with nothing but positive vibes. Reed, I want to give you a gift since this is the season of giving. Um, for folks who may have missed the episode with Hall of Fame coach and who I, I want to deem right now, if he hasn't officially been deemed as Mr. NFL, Dick LeBeau. Um, Reed, for the folks at home listening, Dick LeBeau has a he has a tradition that he liked to do around the holiday season. Um, can you remind them what that is? Yes, he would recite. Uh, I think the Christmas, the Christmas tale, or the one of the the night before the, Christmas. The night before Christmas. Yeah, he would recite it to his players and you know the team like every year, every Christmas. It's something that we're hoping to get him to do here. That's right, and you know he is a best friend of the show i have no doubt in my mind that he'll jump on here and give us you know even the the minute amount of time to be able to read us that christmas story but reed i want to read you that christmas story right now Aww. but we're going to put a little spin on this it's going to be the night before game day. and the night before what the night before game day oh. and i'm going to play i'm going to play this for you guys right now so you at home you'll be able to listen along but i will recommend to find us on the youtube channel uh to be able to watch the visual that goes along with it because there's nothing else that gets me more excited than football than some of the biggest hits so we're also going to play the biggest hits from the 2023 2024 college football season it was the night before game day and all through the halls not a player was stirring not even their footballs the jerseys were hung in the lockers with care in hopes that a victory soon would be there the fans were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of touchdowns danced in their heads and coaches with playbooks and refs with their flags had just settled down for a night without nags. When out on the field, there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my dorm to see what was the matter. Away to the stadium, I flew like a flash, tore open the gates, and made a quick dash. The moon on the turf, the grand football field, gave a luster of midday, and fans that cheered. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature team bus and players with gear. With the little old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be Coach Nick. More rapid than the Eagles, his players they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Bama, now Buckeyes, now Tigers and Dogs, on Wolverines, on Sooners, on Ducks and Hogs. To the top of the poles, to the top of them all, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the stadium, the players they flew, with a bus full of gear, and Coach Nick too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the field, the prancing and pawing of each cleated heel. As I drew in my head and was turning around, onto the sidelines, Coach Nick came with a bound. He was dressed in all crimson, from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with chalk, dust, and soot. A bundle of playbooks he had flung on his back, and he looked like a tactician just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. 
His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the hair on his head was as white as snow. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the lockers, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside from his nose, and giving a nod to the field, he rose. He sprang to his bus, to this team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, as they drove out of sight, Happy game day to all, and to all a good night. That and look who we was... and look who we have and look who we have we have Coach Nick with us right now. Look at this, man! Oh Happy game day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>